السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته والحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف المرسلين سيدنا ونبينا مولانا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين الله سبحانه وتعالى سيز إن القرآن إن سورة الشعراء يوم لا ينفع مال ولا بنون إلا من أتى الله بقلب سليم that neither your your wealth nor your children will help you on the day of on that day of Qiyamah it will only be those who come to Allah with a sound heart. My name is Dr. Shoyab Wadi and welcome to Health Matters, a comprehensive chat with the Islamic Medical Association of South Africa. As you can guess by my introduction, we're going to be discussing matters of the heart. That ayah, of course, is to deal with the spiritual heart. Allah SWT has got a special place for our spiritual heart. And we know that we will be judged according to the quality of our heart. And there are many sicknesses of our spiritual heart which will jeopardize us and make us weep on that day of Qiyamah. And there are many cures which we can try and effect to that spiritual heart, which include remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which include turning to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for help, which include avoiding backbiting and ribbit and envy. There are many, many different things. But today we are not going to discuss that. On my side here, I've got Dr. Farooq Mamdu. Dr. Farooq Mamdu is an eminent, good-looking cardiologist from Lanesia and the south of Johannesburg, practicing in private practice and in the public hospital at, uh, in Johannesburg. And Dr. Mamdu is a cardiologist and expert on matters of the heart, of the physical heart. And we are going to be discussing some aspects around cardiac disease and cardiology. And we look forward to you engaging with us with your questions and your comments and any uh, information which you would like to know. But I'm going to let Dr. Farooq Mamdu tell us a little bit about the heart and what it does for you. <coughs> Jazakallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thanks for that well-deserved, uh, not well-so-deserved introduction, uh, Dr. Wadi. Um, as we sit here today, we all, I'm sure, sure everyone is at the foremost part of their minds worried about their hearts. Since, uh, unfortunately, in this country and many other countries, heart disease is probably one of the most commonest diseases affecting people today. And uh, no one uh, can claim to be free from any heart disease or heart disease risk, I would say. Um, and today's discussion is meant to sort of stimulate a little bit of insight into matters of the heart, physical matters of the heart, and to discuss things that do affect the heart, which, which um, I'm sure as we go through the show today, we'll realize that almost everybody, of, uh, especially the more elderly people in our community, are affected by. Um, <clears throat> if we look at the heart and such, um, we, we try to understand what it does. And the main function of the heart essentially is to pump blood to all the organs. It does so by various mechanisms. It's essentially a very big muscular structure um, that fills with blood and then pumps blood out. It has to deliver blood to all organs of the body and therefore it has a lot of work to do. Unfortunately, um, the heart is one organ in your body that can never take a rest. If it does stop for any reason, um, the rest of the body will cease to get oxygen or, or nutrition and the rest of the body would not function at all. Um, so unfortunately, the heart has to carry on working, and to do so, it's, it involves quite a complex interplay of things, such as uh, coronary disease, um, coronary arteries, which supply the heart with muscle, or with the oxygen, the heart muscle with oxygen. It uh, undergoes certain changes with certain other diseases, such as hypertension and diabetes and so on, which affect not just the flow of blood to the heart, but as well as the structure and function of the heart. Obviously, blood comes into the heart, it needs to get pumped out, so there's a regulatory system in the heart itself, in the different chambers of the heart, such as the valves, which regulate that flow of blood. Yeah. And I think we'll I think, be discussing I think it's important, uh, you know, that you brought up there, Farouk, that uh, uh, the heart is not just functioning in isolation. It's dependent on the very blood that it pumps, you know. It has to get its own blood supply. And we'll show you some pictures now, which will show you how those blood vessels can, can become affected and 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 can become can become damaged as time as time goes on and then lead to progressive progressive uh, damage uh, to the heart uh, there's some uh, pictures coming up now which will give you an idea of what uh, what a healthy blood vessel looks like and what an unhealthy one looks like can you just tell us some of the things which will lead to your blood vessels going from that healthy state to that unhealthy state? Uh, mm. for Essentially, the blood vessels that supply the muscle of the heart are the, the lifeline we, we talk about. And they the tubular structures which allow the delivery of blood. So they're essentially pipelines. And the pipelines essentially become clogged with various uh, diseased or, um, matter, mostly cholesterol. But the, the, the reason they get top, um, the cholesterol deposits inside the blood vessels is due to a lot of other factors. Um, things which we'll touch on a little bit, I guess, today would be things like smoking, diabetes, high blood pressure, 
and other diseases of lifestyle such as lack of exercise, mm -hmm. lack of appropriate diet and so on. And these things lead to the conduits or the pipes of, uh, that supply the heart with its own nutrition and blood supply, uh, leading them to be blocked or clogged up, therefore affecting the ability of the heart to perform its normal function, which essentially is to pump blood and, out. And that's really what we call a, a heart attack, am I right? That's correct. So that's when one of these little conduits or blood vessels which supply blood to the heart itself. So the heart pumps this blood to supply its own its own energy and needs. And when one of these blood vessels gets blocked, that's what we call a, a heart attack or a myocardial infarction. Can you just take us through the process of how that occurs, mm -hmm. how this little plaque or blockage leads to that uh, myocardial infarction, what the consequences of that are? Sure. So we have uh, many, many blood vessels that supply the heart. And uh, <clears throat> essentially, the blood vessels, any one of them or many at any given time, may become occluded or narrowed. The processes that lead to this narrowing are things like we mentioned a little bit before, mm -hmm. such as excessive smoking, the, 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 the advent of diabetes and not controlling the diabetes, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. hypertension, having a high cholesterol level, um, genetic factors such sure. as someone in your family having had a heart attack before, having high blood pressure, diabetes, yes. as well as poor lifestyle choices such as poor eating habits, um, lots of salt content in your diet or heavy cholesterol in your diet and so, lack of so exercise. Then, so then you get a heart attack, this blood so vessel essentially blocks. what happens is that... And then the, what happens to you then? Yeah, essentially these things start to narrow down the blood, the conduit, and they affect the heart muscle. If the blood vessel is narrowed to a certain point, the muscle is no longer able to receive energy in terms of oxygen, and therefore it can't function. Okay. What would happen essentially is that that area being affected, depending on where it was affected, the muscle would cease to function, and therefore the pump action of the heart delivering blood to the organs would become in, uh, would become compromised. But some people say I had a small heart attack, yeah. and other people say I had a big heart attack. So in essence, does that does that describe how much muscle is affected or how big the blockage is? Absolutely. It, uh, it depends on a number of factors. Number one, usually when someone says I've had a small heart attack, they mean either the blood vessel was narrowed to a point where it didn't damage too much muscle, okay. or it affected a very small blood vessel um, of the heart, so it didn't really damage a large area of heart muscle. Okay. Okay. However, if it were to affect a very large blood vessel right at the top of the origin of the blood vessel, and the degree of occlusion or narrowing was significant, like a 100% blockage compared yes. to a 70% blockage, that would be a large heart attack. Okay, and that will affect a large amount of muscle. And obviously, that may lead to life-threatening complications quite quickly. Very quickly. In fact, it could lead to sudden death, somebody sudden passing death. away quite quickly if the entire heart stops. That's correct. Uh, unfortunately, the prediction of where it's going to happen is very difficult. Uh, when someone experiences symptoms, uh, which we'll talk about, I guess, in a, in a little right, while, right. Um, you're unsure of whether you're going to have a small heart attack or a big heart attack. So let's tell, about, tell us about those symptoms. Can you tell from the symptoms, am I, I'm having a small heart attack or big heart attack? Can you tell if you're having a heart attack at all? Because obviously, not everything which causes chest pain is, is a heart attack. There may be other things. Absolutely. Um, the most important symptom to, to heed is the advent of chest pain. However, chest pain is a very uh, heterogeneous group of, of symptoms. I mean, you could have chest pain related to reflux disease, chest pain related to a pneumonia, chest wall trauma, such as having an injury or a cracked rib. They all can manifest as chest pain, but the typical chest pain that one experiences from a narrowed artery or leading to a heart attack is what we call angina. Right. And that chest pain typically is a sort of a rubber band or a heavy rock sensation pressing on the chest. It's usually accompanied by other symptoms such as nausea or even vomiting, sweating. The pain may in fact, what we say, radiate mm -hmm. or extend down the left side of the, of the body, the left arm, around the left side of the neck sure. or the left jaw. However, <clears throat> we know that this is a very, very typical form of angina. But any sort of chest pain may manifest in other means. Some people uh, describe it as a sharp pain. It may be at the back. It may be on the right side, in fact. And uh, unfortunately, the, the description of pain is not always exactly the same in everyone. So if you're having a heart attack, you may experience the typical form of chest pain, which we call angina, or it may be a atypical, maybe a burning sensation, a sharp stabbing sensation, not necessarily on the left side, more all over the chest, or even on the right side, even the back. I mean, obviously, from our side as doctors, often whether we think of a heart attack or not will depend on who's getting the chest pain. If it's a young teenage girl who just had a heart broken, it's much more likely to be anxiety or stress. Whereas if it's an elderly diabetic 
who's had uh, who's a smoker, who's had previous heart attacks, uh, even minor chest pain, or even a bit of shortness of breath may be a clue to a heart attack uh, rather than you know the typical yeah. features of, of chest pain that you describe. I think the more important thing is if you are experiencing a form of chest pain, it's to actually what we call in the world of cardiology is know your numbers. So know the risk factors that you may already have that put you at risk of having a heart attack. And therefore, whatever pain you have, it's important to seek it out. So if you are a 15-year-old girl who's uh, right. relatively healthy with no risk Unless factors. Unless you have a strong genetic predisposition. Absolutely. Yeah. So if you know that you have, you have a very strong genetic predisposition, you have a first-line sibling or a mother or father who's experienced a heart attack or had some sort of coronary disease, if you are diabetic, if you have high blood pressure, if your cholesterol level is high, or if you're unsure if it is high, um, you may have a history of someone in your family that you know has high cholesterol levels on treatment, for example. If you are obese and not exercising and not generally in a good state of health, then you should never ignore any type of chest pain. So importantly is to, if you have the symptom, to know your numbers, know your cholesterol level, know your sugar level, know your blood, blood pressure, pressure level, sure. and so on. Know the numbers Absolutely. that you are affected by. And therefore, any pain that you do experience, it's often wise. Well, to you know what's in your bank account. You should know what's in your body, I think. Absolutely. So I think those numbers are important. I think in the picture behind us now, we've got a brain attack. Yeah. Will you tell us what's a brain attack? Or yeah. the, some, the, the more common term for it is? It's a stroke. A Absolutely. stroke, yes. Yeah. Um, the, the problem with, um, as I said, a heart attack is a narrowing of an artery supply in the muscle of the heart. A stroke is the same process. However, it's a narrowing of an artery supply in an area of brain tissue. So it's the same risk factors that put you at risk, such as hypertension, diabetes, smoking, mm -hmm. high cholesterol levels, and lack of exercise, as well as age. As one, these diseases unfortunately come on with, uh, in a progressive fashion. So if you were diagnosed with diabetes and you didn't control it, it's not from the day you were diagnosed. It's usually a few Before years later that, yes. that this uh, debris starts to accumulate, and it accumulates over many years. So obviously as one gets older and if one is living with these diseases, by the time one gets to a certain age, it had time to affect you. And therefore, being older as well with chest pain, like we mentioned earlier, you a younger risk, person, yeah. Very unlikely. Okay, we go, we're going to go to a break soon, but we're going to open up the lines uh, j just during the break and after the break. So uh, if people want to send through the questions or they want to ask us any questions, they can give us a call. The number is 011-086-7701 or 7702 or 7703. They can also email us or send us a message on Facebook or Twitter, and those details will follow on the screen, and you can then, we'll try and respond to you through those uh, avenues, inshallah. Uh, I mean, besides the brain and the, and the heart, obviously other blood vessels can be blocked as well, in your legs, uh, in your different organs, your kidneys, your intestines, and so forth and so on, and it's part of the same process, really. Mm -hmm. uh, besides a heart attack, what is heart failure? Somebody will say, I've been diagnosed with heart failure. What does that mean? A heart failure is essentially a problem where the muscle of the heart is no longer to eject blood or pump blood circulating around the body, and it's no longer able to expand and receive blood appropriately from the rest of the body. And that's what we call a state of congestion or congestive heart failure. Um, essentially, it can come about by a number of processes. One would be having a heart attack where the muscle is damaged, Clearly, it's no longer to perform its usual functions. So that would lead to a state of heart failure where, it's mm -hmm. un, in, un, where the heart is unable to pump blood out or unable to receive blood appropriately from right, the rest of right, the body. Right. A number of other diseases may affect the heart as yes. well, such as problems in the valves of the heart, and these can be genetic okay. or, uh, sorry, congenital acquired at birth. It may occur as a, re as a result of an infection on a heart valve, um, which would lead to then the leaking of the heart a valve, depending on, we've got four valves in the heart and any one of them could be affected. Um, and this would lead to a state where blood being pumped out either falls back into the heart okay. or leaks so back to the wrong person. So not the valve's efficient. not efficient, either blocked or okay. leaking. So that would also to lead to a state so, of heart failure. So, I mean, the whole idea, obviously, is not to get a heart attack. You don't want to get a heart attack if you can avoid it, because by the time you get a heart attack, the damage is done. Uh, obviously, if someone comes in with a heart attack very quickly, it can be treated. It can be sometimes reversed completely so that no damage gets done. Tell us a little bit about preventing uh, cardiac disease and heart mm. attacks in particular, mm. and also the importance of coming in quickly when you're having a heart attack so that uh, you can treat it and reverse it completely. Absolutely. The, um, the advent of a heart attack, as I said earlier, generally the narrowing of the artery occurs over a long period of time. 
So one may experience a little bit of chest pain, usually with exertion, because one can imagine that if you were to exercise, your heart has to work harder. It has to pump blood out faster and more efficiently, and to do such, it needs a better supply of, heart, uh, of blood vessels or of, of, of uh, blood cells or oxygen. And so a narrowing that's not necessarily significant enough to damage the heart, but when the heart has to work harder, that narrowing now becomes significant because it's limiting the efficient flow of blood. So maybe a bit of excessive tiredness or chest pain even that goes away when you rest sure. but comes on with exercise, that would be a symptom, what we call stable angina because it's brought on by exercise and relieved by rest. So that would be one symptom. The second symptom, of course, is when the lesion is actually occurring where there's muscle damage. Okay. And that would be a full-blown heart attack. But I think more importantly is to have yourself checked out first. Like, I think there's, there's quite a lot we need to discuss, especially when it comes to screening. And I'd just like to encourage the viewers to call in. We're going to go to an ad break in a minute, but I just want to remind you that the number is 011 086 Seven seven zero one or seven seven zero two or seven seven zero three. We'll go to an ad break now, and we'll see you soon, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Welcome back to Health Matters, a comprehensive chat as presented by the Islamic Medical Association of South Africa. We were discussing heart disease with Dr. Farooq Mamdu, and we were just getting to some interesting aspects of uh, when to uh, screen patients and who to look out for for heart disease. Obviously, not everybody uh, who has chest pain has got a heart attack, and not everybody who has a heart attack, unfortunately, comes for, for, for the checkup when they need to. But, but tell us what type of things, Farooq, you need to be concerned about, which will take you to your doctor and say, you know, look, I need to have myself checked out. I think there may be something going on with my heart. Yeah. Traditionally, I think if you have risk factors, so it's, it's quite simple. I mean, blood pressure is an easy measurement that anyone can do and mm -hmm. most uh, sort of even local pharmacies or, or disc games and so on in these kind of shops, yeah, shopping yeah. centers take that. So if you, have a, if you have high blood pressure or hypertension or on treatment for it, even though it's well controlled, if you are diabetic, or even Should though it it's be well controlled. Should it be every diabetic, every hypertensive? Would, yeah, I think every, well, every older diabetic, every older hypertensive. And, and how would you screen those patients? What would you do for them? Well, first of all, if anyone with risk factors has chest pain, that's someone that should right, be right. checked out no, no okay. matter what. Or has an unexplained uh, queasy feeling that isn't related to anything they can put their fingers on. Okay. Someone had a collapsing episode, a blackout, for example, sure, okay. also. Should That's important. A, That's very important, yes. Someone with palpitations, which is the awareness of the heart beating in the chest, maybe okay. very heavily without exercise. Um, I think those are anyone with symptoms of heart failure, which would include shortness of breath or excess of shortness of breath, leg swelling. Um, so, so I think those are pretty clear. If you have one of those symptoms and you are in that risk group, and even people who are not in that risk group should seriously consider seeing their doctor. You probably want to start off with a general practitioner who should have experience and be able to tell you, look, this is serious. It's nothing to play around with. Go and see your cardiologist and then, and then be assessed. Mm -hmm. uh, and then how would you assess them? Uh, for yeah. Essentially, if uh, the risk factors are playing in and the symptoms fit, um, usually it starts off with a general examination. Uh -huh. Often... Uh, symptoms, for example, of heart disease like leaking or block valves can be appreciated just with auscultation Easily, or listening yeah. with yeah. a stethoscope. Examining a person for heart failure such as leg swelling. So it's a good physical examination you know, performed sure. by a clinician. Sure. That would be the first step. The second, more technical aspects would be things like echocardiography, which is a, a sonar Looking of the heart. Picture we, of the heart yeah. Absolutely. We've seen pictures of how babies look inside uh, you know, mother's wombs and so on. This would be looking at the heart with the same sort of uh, right. sonar. It can detect a lot of things. It can detect areas of the heart muscle that's not moving properly, for example, okay. if it's been affected well, I mean, by In fact, you can detect a baby's heart on the sonar of Absolutely. the mother. Yeah. So, so a so. heart sonar would be the next step in part of the workup or investigation. Yes. Um, the next thing, if the patient is stable, there are other tests that can be performed, but uh, um, sort of a very bedroom or bedside investigation would be a, what we call an ECG, ECG yes, or an yeah. electrocardiogram, and particularly one that's done under stress, which is often referred to as a stress, stress test. Or so a you make them run treadmill. on the treadmill up and down the stairs and so or on. something like that. And the idea of this test is if the lesion or what we would say narrowing is a, a significant one, more than a 50% narrowing, but it hasn't caused damage already. It hasn't led to a heart attack. It's just sitting there waiting to happen. A stress test essentially is by making the person exercise, whether they're on a bicycle or a treadmill or even running up steps and mm -hmm, so on. Mm -hmm. we asking, we're making the heart work harder. Therefore, we're asking the heart to 
do more function and therefore the heart needs more blood more supply. Blood. Yes. A narrowing, even though it's not critical, will limit that amount of blood supply. So they'll get and pain. They'll, they'll get they pain. may get pain, but more specifically, they get certain changes on the ECG okay. during the stress test, and that can detect a lesion. So even if someone is asymptomatic during, and, the, and stress during the stress test and just wants to have themselves checked out, often a stress test can easily detect a problem that's about to happen but hasn't happened yet. Okay. Um, so just to remind viewers of that number again, it's 011-086-7701 or 7702 or 7703. It's on your screen now. Please call us if you have any issues you would like to discuss around this important topic. Uh, so, so Farouk, are there patients who should be screened who have no symptoms? Mm. People who are otherwise okay, feel that they are well? Yeah. <clears throat> Unfortunately, um, we know about diseases like hypertension and diabetes. We often refer to them as silent killers. Mm -hmm. And often the first sort of diagnosis of a heart attack is made at the time of the heart attack, which right. is too soon, uh, which, which is too late, actually. Right, right. So someone's already having a completely blocked artery and is busy experiencing a heart attack where the muscle of the heart is starting to die. Uh, and that's the time they're coming to hospital. Okay. We don't like that. We'd rather have someone come in before they have a heart attack so that we can detect it. So... Again, knowing your numbers is important if you are diabetic. And I would say anyone over the age of 40 who has a risk factor, a significant risk factor like heavy smoking, diabetes, hypertension, high cholesterol, or a very strong family history sure. of heart, heart attacks and strokes in the family, that is someone once they hit the age of 40, irrespective of symptoms, they may be completely symptom-free, they should have themselves checked out, at least have a stress test. Okay. I mean, many... Uh uh, policies and those type of things would insist that you have a stress test before they would accept you uh, at that level, That's am I right? right? Absolutely, because you don't want to ensure someone is going to die the next day, even though they're completely asymptomatic. And that's the problem. The problem is, is that this disease is often undetected until the day the event happens. And that's uh, by far, we, we, we don't screen enough people, I would say. Um, and that's why we miss a lot of the diagnosis. And we only make the diagnosis at the time of the event, which is, again, too late. Um, so I would say that anyone with a risk factor, be it one or two or all of them, um, once you hit the age of 40, if you haven't had any symptoms, one should check them out. Diabetics in particular, as we know, diabetes affects nerves and often leads to the deadening of the nerves, so mm -hmm. s uh, sensation is lost particularly. So they may not, get the they may not even have chest pain, pain at all, yeah. but they ex may be experiencing a very large heart attack without any symptoms of chest pain. They may then come in much later, after the event has occurred, with heart failure already. By then, obviously, the damage is done, and it's a bit hard to reverse that. So diabetics in particular should pay attention to having themselves screened, even annually. I mean, I mean, there are many pe people sitting out there now, and they're going to be saying, oh, I don't know, these doctors, they just want me to have tests. There's nothing wrong with me, you know. Uh, but I think, look, we've got a caller coming in now, so we'll discuss this after we speak to our caller. Uh, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum salam. Uh, can I speak to the cardiologist, please? Yes, please. Speak yeah. to Dr. Mamdou. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, Assalamu alaikum, doctor. Uh, I have a son who's 22 years old, and he has a history of high cholesterol for the last uh, four or five years. Doctor have put him on statins. Is that okay for him, 10 milligrams? <clears throat> Gee, it depends on his level of cholesterol. I think uh, a high cholesterol level or a high lipid level is never too soon to treat, um, as long as the test was done in the appropriate setting. Um, so the test needs to be done properly after an overnight fast and done first thing in the morning before breakfast or before anything is eaten. And the test must be then checked. Uh, and if the level is relatively high, and we have sort of uh, reference values we use to determine what's normal. Um, a 22-year-old with high cholesterol, I'm guessing that there's a family history of high cholesterol in that family. And it may be, you may have skipped a generation, so you, yourself, being the father, may not have a high level. But if you look back into the family history, I'm pretty sure you'll find someone who had a high level. Uh, uh, brother, I think, we, I think we've lost that caller, but we've got another caller. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Wa alaikum salam. I'm calling on behalf of my wife. Gee, what's your my question, wife. brother? Uh, the question is, uh, my wife gets, uh, gets uh, severe chest pains daily. And uh, says uh, three, four, five times a day she had to take these little tablets that she has to put underneath her tongue. And uh, uh, about two years ago, she had to go to Hroski Hospital, and because uh, the doctor said she had a, a slight heart attack, and it's okay. going to lead up to 
a major heart attack. Okay. Has she had any treatment, brother, for this uh, for that heart attack? Did she get any stents or any angiograms or anything like that? Do you remember? I think we lost the call. I think we lost the call. So. I said, has your has your wife had any treatment for that uh, heart attack or for the chest pain, like a stent or a, or a angiogram or anything like that? Do you remember? Yes, yes, yes. Yes, and uh, she had uh, ECGA. Okay. More than once. And uh, did she have an angiogram? Uh, just hang on, please. Maybe you can talk about. Uh, um, for I think. Um, no, she haven't. Okay. Okay. I think it's important in someone like that, especially if the pain is relieved by the tablet under the tongue. The commonly the used tablet under the tongue is a uh, something containing a nitrate, uh, often referred to as Angie said. Uh, that's the generic name of the tablet. And what it does is it dilates blood vessels. So if there is a narrowing, and one can imagine that the narrowing is causing her chest pain or angina, by taking the tablet under the tongue, it dilates the blood vessel there by allowing the blood to flow through better. And if that relieves the pain, then clearly there is a narrowing of significance. I would suggest that she has a stress test done quite quite soon, um, and we and she probably uh, with that kind of history, if if, if truly she is being relieved by the yeah. angiogram tablet, she probably needs an. Sounds angiogram. very much like she may need an angiogram, brother. But obviously, your doctors need to assess the situation and see what the risk factors are. And an angiogram is not without risk. So if she's got any other issues like kidney problems and so forth, they may need to prepare her and do it all in a controlled environment. But sometimes, if you do an angiogram, you can find out where the blockages are and may be able to relieve her pain. Inshallah. We've, uh, so. Brother, I would advise you to, to, to go and see your physician back at Khrutiskir, inshallah. We've got another call on the line. Hello. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Hello. Hello. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, do you have a question for Dr. Mamdu? Are we good? Do you have a question for Dr. Mamdu? No. Uh, can we help you, brother? How can we help you? Yeah. How can we help you, sister? Sister, I don't think the sister can hear us very well. Uh, um, so far, we've got another caller. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum wa salam. Do you have a question for Dr. Mamdu, brother? Yes, I have. Okay, uh, go ahead. Okay, look, uh, you know, approximately 12 years ago, uh, I went for an ECG and you know, the physician told me that uh, my symptoms are such that, uh, you know, it, it denotes that I had a heart attack. But it was, you know, a day after uh, I did a marathon. And, you know, he was very concerned, so he referred me to a cardiologist. And the cardiologist had a look at me and he did the stress. And, you know, I, uh, you know, I passed the stress quite well because, you know, I'm quite a fit person. And uh, eventually, you know, they diagnosed me with a enlarged, uh, muscle, uh, you know, on the, I, I'm not too sure whether it was on the right or the left art article. Right. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and he told me that, look, it wasn't so bad, it's not benign and that sort of thing. And, you know, up to now, uh, I, uh, you know, I still don't have any problems. Okay. Uh, but now and again, I do have chest pains, but I don't think that the chest pains are related to, uh, uh, you know, to my heart. I, well, I, I, I don't think so, at least. Uh, you know, it's more to do with the reflux. Farouk, what would you say? Uh, tell me, is, is, it, uh, you know, uh, is there any concern for, I, for a thing like that? I think if, you, if you're if you a relatively uh, healthy individual, you say you run a marathon, 12 years ago you had chest pain, um, it was checked out by a cardiologist who cleared you, who did an, you know, hopefully a very thorough examination and, a, and, a, and, a, and was an experienced uh, cardiologist. I wouldn't worry too much as long as you haven't acquired another disease. Uh, yeah. or acquired more risk factors such as hypertension or started smoking and so on. And if you continue to be fit and exercise regularly, check your cholesterol, check your sugar level every now and then, check your blood pressure, I think you're in good shape and I don't think you should worry. Perhaps your pain, as you, just, as you well said, is related to reflux um, and, and that obviously can be treated in a totally different way which is uh, maybe not as life-threatening as a heart attack. Um, so I would be a bit uh, more relaxed in your case. Um, I would just want to screen myself in terms of blood tests for, for example, cholesterol and diabetes and have your blood pressure checked. As long as you're not smoking, I think you're in good shape. Alhamdulillah. Is that, uh, is that, does that answer your question, brother? 
I think, I think we've lost the brother. But Farouk, I mean, that's an important question. <coughs> the people who are generally fit and healthy can also have heart attacks. And sometimes exercise, like a marathon, can precipitate a heart attack in someone who's not prepared for it. Mm. Uh, so that may be something people need to be aware of. We've got another caller. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam. How can we help you, sister? Dr. Mamdu is, uh, is available. Uh, doctor, a few years back, I had kidney failure due to hypertension. And uh, um, I used to get very tired and I went to the doctor and they said my cholesterol is very high. I'm taking some vaccine at uh, 20 milligram. And a year after that, I had an angina attack. So I'm uh, on this bulk or tablets that's a 5 milligram. Right. Should I carry on with that or should I stop that? Uh, are you are you are you still having kidney failure, sister? Uh, yes, my one kidney is slightly damaged. Okay, but you're not on dialysis or anything. Like no, that. Uh, I was lucky not to go on dialysis. Okay, I think uh, <clears throat> if you had a high cholesterol level and you are on treatment and you're checking it out regularly, um, yes. the bilocor tablet that's been prescribed for you probably has some a dual effect that was probably intended. It has a blood pressure lowering effect such as, you, as you said, you have hypertension, so it will be a beneficial drug to use for hypertension. But also it has an anti-anginal property in that it slows down the heart and it relaxes the heart muscle, thereby allowing the heart to not demand as much blood as it, as, as it requires. Um, it also controls the vasomotor tone, we call, of the coronary arteries, it allows them to relax a bit. Mm -hmm. However, the, the, the use of the beta blocker needs to be monitored. And if your symptoms persist despite the fact that you're on these treatments, then uh, further investigations are necessary. But if you haven't had an event since then and you are in kidney failure or you're not, and you're not requiring dialysis, perhaps then your risk is what we call modified and mm -hmm. they've managed to treat you in a more conservative fashion, we call. Medical therapy still works. It's still very effective and it does prevent you from having uh, dreaded complications such as heart failure or heart attacks. I think, I think one of the important points is that kidney failure or kidney disease goes very closely with heart disease. And uh, in fact, having a kidney dysfunction is a very strong predictor of having a heart problem with time. So those people who do have even mild kidney problems should be aware that their risk of heart disease is much higher than the general population. And I think you should stay in touch with your cardiologist and physician and make sure you have your regular checkups and your cholesterol and that controlled. Okay, sister, we have another call on the line. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. How can we help you, sister? Uh, I like to stay anonymous. You no see, problem. I had a bypass, triple bypass, two years ago. And I had no, uh, no, what to call the, no, just thing that I have got the heart problem. Okay, it came so out of the me, blue. Uh, no, no, but my, uh, I used to uh, spew a lot very frequently. Gee. And after that, for two months, I had a pain on my, uh, on my chest. Right. Gee. So I thought it was ulcers. Right. So uh, I didn't worry so much about it. So I was supposed to go for an endoscope. Right. Gee. So before that, then I had one day, I just had a, a, a severe pain in my chest. Right. So uh, I just lay down, but I couldn't help it. So I was asked, what is wrong with me? I and then you, you is pain. that when you had the bypass, sister? Oh, my God. Is that when so you had, had the bypass? The bypass, yeah. Gee. But I had no sign of a heart problem. Gee. That I had a heart problem. The only sign I had, the only uh, sign I had, that is that I was to spew very frequently. Okay. Do you have a question, sister? Then, Do you have a question about it? Have I guess? Do you have a question about it? Yeah. What, what's so your question, sister? Then, uh, my chest was pending for two months. Okay. okay? And then I was supposed to put an uh, endoscope, the nurse said no. Then suddenly my hair, my chest started paining Gee. on a Thursday. Right. Right? On a Thursday, it started paining so in the night, so I was sent to the hospital. So the, I went to the casualty, and the doctor said, okay, I must wait for the cardiologist. Gee. So when the cardiologist came down, he took a picture, and I could see, oh, no, there's trouble. I said, my heart was black, like, you know? so, so, so how can we help you now, sister? How can we help you? 
How can we help you now, sister? Yeah. How can we help you now? Yeah, yeah. And then. Uh, um, I think what I think I think what 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 we what we need, we're trying to explain to your sister is that it is it can be quite common that you can have uh, uh, you know chest pain from other causes and you can still have a heart attack. So it's possible you had an ulcer and you had a heart attack. It's quite possible that you could have had both pathologies at the same time. And you know the one can they can even be interrelated because sometimes medication that you use to prevent heart attacks like aspirin and so forth can lead to ulcers. So there is quite a strong link between uh, some of the different types of chest pain. And just because you know you have an ulcer doesn't mean you may not have a heart attack in the future. For Gee, absolutely. Unfortunately, as we said earlier, <coughs> chest pain manifests in very different ways okay. um, for, from different diseases. We, we've got another caller on the line. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum. I'd like to speak to the doctor. Please, go ahead. Assalamu alaikum. Go ahead, sister. Assalamu alaikum. I have angina. Um, I've been having problems for the past two months. I've been able to mend the sweaty. I am in a pause, but I also get very dizzy. So I heard about live, a blood analysis, and I went for that test. Um, and the, the if it's a doctor or physician, said I must take, um, stop my amlodipine. And I must stop the high blood blood pressure tablet and I must stop all the medication. I must now take only what he has given me, which is hemp oil, lucky sip, and CQ10. Okay. But have, taking have, that, have, has he checked your blood pressure, uh, sister? Oh, no, they just did the live blood analysis. My blood is, my blood is 170, 190. Farouk, you want to comment on that? I, I think. Mean, Sister, I would be very, very concerned <coughs> if somebody is modifying your blood pressure medication without checking, checking your blood pressure because mm. there's actually no evidence that the live blood analysis actually improves your outcome in terms of heart attacks or cardiac disease. But Farouk mm. will tell you some more. Gee, I think what's very important think, um, is that all these other therapies may have a role in, in sort of uh, um, healthy living and sort of yeah. maybe have a role in terms of uh, reducing progression of disease, but certainly are not curative, and that's 100% certain. The because curative methods of treating your, your angina would be risk factor modification, mm. and the risk factors are, as you said, you are hypertensive, perhaps there's a genetic component as well. Mm. I would be very hesitant um, stopping your antihypertensive mm. therapy in, in, in lieu of sort of uh, other therapies. If the other therapies are instituted, certainly I would be checking my blood pressure again, knowing that I've stopped my antihypertensive therapy and I'd like to know what my blood pressure is doing now. And if your blood pressure, as you say, is still 170 or 190, that's very high blood pressure. Uh, also, I mean, it's important to note that in women, especially as you get older and you mentioned the menopause, as they reach the menopausal age and older, the risk of heart attacks increases quite, quite substantially. Mm -hmm. The estrogen that uh, a woman is protected by in the younger age tends to disappear as, as you get older. And unfortunately, the, the hormone replacement therapy doesn't sort of completely mitigate the risk. Am I right? That's correct. In fact, the hormone replacement therapy in some, in instances, some instances can actually it, yeah. lead to further progression of disease. We've got another caller. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alaikum salam. How can we help you, sister? It seems only Doctor, sisters are phoning this evening. My kidney function is about 30%, but the problem now is that my, left, that my tongue is shaking. I want to know what is the cause of it. Uh, sorry, I couldn't hear that uh, too clearly, sister. You said your, your tummy is shaking. Tongue. No, my tongue. My tongue. Your tongue is shaking. And that ball. Uh, sorry, sister, I'm losing your tongue and your... My love, uh, my love. Okay. I think I, I understood the sister. We were losing her there. I yeah. don't know whether it's a signal or what the Sound story like is. Sounds like she said her lip and she her tongue She said her tongue and shaking. her lip are shaking. She has a 30% kidney function. Yeah. So our eminent uh, nephrologist here, I'm sure, has a Look, I'm not answer. sure that it's related to your kidney function if your tongue and lip is shaking, but it can be a, a sign of lots of different things, including strokes sometimes. Uh, some forms of uh, movement disorders can present with uh, abnormalities of movement of the tongue and the lip. And... Those can be related to vascular disease, and there can be an increased risk in people with kidney failure. Most women's tongue shakes because they talk too much, but uh, in some women it is pathological, unfortunately. <laughs> some so, people may argue it's always pathological. Okay, we've got another caller. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. 
Walaikum Salaam. Can I speak to the doctor, please? Please, Sayo. please, go ahead. Alaikum. Dr. Mamdu, Walaikum Salaam. Dr. Mamdu, my name is Faisal. I'm uh, phoning in connection with my wife. Uh, she has a uh, uh, disease called Takayasu, which I'm sure you are very well aware of, doctor, Gee. as a cardiologist. Gee. Um, it was discovered 20, 20 years ago. Right, right. But at the time when uh, the disease was uh, diagnosed, it was dormant. But oh. what has happened now after, you know, in the 20 years that there's narrowing of the arteries. Gee. And uh, now, uh, you know, we obviously had uh, seen the specialist. And uh, I just wanted some sort of comfort and perhaps uh, your opinion that she obviously has to have the surgery done. Which, which Gee, arteries uh, are narrowed, uh, brother? It's the one on the right-hand side, the one that is the aorta, the big one, Doc. The aorta, G. Okay. And yeah, are, are the, does she have high blood pressure? G, she has. Gee, uh, okay. And is there yeah. any narrowing to the vessels, to her arms or to her kidneys or to her legs? Uh, no, there aren't any narrowings there, no. Okay. Un unfortunately, uh, it's a very rare disease, but it is a, a quite a serious disease. Takayasu, for the, our listeners, is a disease where you have progressive narrowings and dilatations or uh, enlargements of certain blood vessels, and they affect the, what we call large and medium blood vessels. So these would include the large aorta that comes off the main blood vessel that uh, exits the heart, as well okay. as the coronary arteries, arteries in the brain, arteries okay. affecting any sort of large organ. So Takayasu's disease is a, it's a very rare disease, but it, it's related to an inflammatory process, which leads to what we call strictures, which are narrowings, and okay. then dilatations or bubbles, if you, if you will, in different blood vessels. It can affect many blood vessels. Unfortunately, the, the therapy is related to when that particular area or that area of bl uh, blood supply is being compromised mm -hmm. by yeah. either severe narrowing leading to ischemia, which is a lack of delivery of appropriate right. blood supply to that particular blood vessel supply area, or to a dilatation where the blood vessel stretches to such a point where the walls become thin. If you think about blowing up a balloon, if you yeah. blow it up too, too much, at some point it's going to burst. So okay. Takayasu's may be... The, the surgery she, that she's intended to have is because either there's a severe narrowing or a severe dilatation. Which may cause a rupture, a rupture as, time, yeah. as time yeah. goes on. Unfortunately, some of these narrowings in many conditions like atherosclerosis that we showed earlier can be, can be treated these days with what we call endovascular approaches. That means they don't cut the person open, they go from the inside. But with takayasus, it is a bit difficult because the vessel may be weak, there may be areas of dilatation, mm -hmm. and so you may rupture the vessel. And you really need a good vascular surgeon who's got uh, extensive experience to have a look and decide mm -hmm. what approach is the best uh, for, for the individual patient? It usually depends on which vessel. So if it's a vessel that starts off right at the beginning of the heart, then usually a cardiothoracic sure, surgeon, sure. in fact, may be involved there because they have to work in the chest cavity. And the heart, around the heart. And yeah. around the heart. Uh, if it involves the uh, more peripheral vessels, such as the carotids or okay. the arms and the legs, I think, I think then we've it lost, will be a vessel. Uh, we've lost uh, that caller, but I hope that helps you, brother, and I hope your, your wife gets full shifa, and Allah SWT makes it Inshallah. easy for you and, and, and for her. We've got another caller on the line. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum. I'm the lady that found earlier that I said the homeopathic chemist changed yes, my yes. medication. We lost you there, Chi. I just... I wanted to say to doctor that I was never ever conscious of my breathing, but right. I am so short of breath and I get so tired. Even some some mornings I can't even walk to my bathroom. So tired I get. I, I think, think you I need think to go and see your physician yeah, and definitely, possibly yeah. your cardiologist because if your blood pressure is very high, mm -hmm. as Dr. Mm -hmm. Mamdu mentioned, I think if you think about hypertension, it's the pressure against which your heart has to pump. So yeah, if your heart yeah, is, yeah. has to pump against a pressure of 170, obviously it has to work very hard to do that. And that puts a lot of strain or load on the heart. So if your blood pressure is high and your heart is struggling to deliver the blood through into that high pressure area, you may get very tired because your heart is tired. It's just not coping with that pressure or that load. So your symptoms of uh, tiredness or shortness of breath may be related simply because your heart is struggling to pump into that high pressure In fact, the, the symptoms you're describing, sister, are suggestive of what we call heart failure. Mm -hmm. And an uncontrolled heart, uh, blood pressure can be one of the causes, but there could be other causes. Like even anemia could cause that. So I think it is important for you to, you to see, see your, your doctor. Yes, I get so short of breath. Uh, my mom had a stroke and she died three days later. Okay. Um, in this year, in, in April. Right. Okay. And um, I am a person I could do 500 jobs at the same time. I am so tired, I can't do just normal things. It's, 
he observes me and I start sweating. I sweat every single day like a yeah. not a little bit, but like. I think, I think you need to see your physician fairly urgently, sister, and I wouldn't wait. Well, she, she said on the analysis, she said she, she uh, detected an enlarged heart. Yes. But I think you need to see a physician fairly urgently because there may be things they may need to do to protect your heart and to improve the function, mm. which could inclu <clears throat> include blood pressure medication, other medications, and it, it, it will also include checking your kidneys, checking your, um, your, uh, your hemoglobin and so forth and so on, because there's lots of different things which can precipitate worsening of the cardiac function. And one of the things may be discontinuing your medicines. Gee. In fact, I think uh, your symptoms of heart failure, as we say, uh, the fact that your mother had a stroke, probably also related to hypertension, put you at very high risk. Um, and uh, the very most effective means of controlling this is to control your blood pressure. So all the other therapies that you are on may make you feel a bit better and maybe so, so uh, have some benefit, but definitely controlling your blood pressure, it's a, it's so, a sister, scientific I'll, I'll, fact that that definitely lowers your chances of having a fatal event. Sister, I would really encourage you to go back to your, your physician and your doctor, and we make dua, inshallah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you relief and gives you full, full shifa. We have another caller. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Dr. Okay. I need to speak to the cardiologist. Please, please. go ahead. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Doc, I'm a little bit concerned about a lot of chest pains that I'm experiencing. The reason for my chest pains is that I fit all the symptoms that you have described. I have swollen feet, I have um, pressure, I have sugar, I'm insulin dependent, and I'm in uh, my mid-50s, I'm obese, and um, I've been to the cardiologist for a checkup, and he tells me everything is fine. So I'm very, very concerned. I had a kidney removed about two years ago because I had a cancerous cyst on the kidney. Why is it unexplained that I have these chest pains? I, I think that, um, that what you're describing, your risk factors are significant and you, your chest pain may in fact uh, be related to your heart. However, if a cardiologist has checked you out and especially if he has checked you out recently, it all depends on, on what his findings were. There may be other reasons that you are experiencing shortness of breath that are related to diabetes or hypertension. Sometimes the terms get a bit confused. When we say everything's fine, Maybe what he means to say is you may not have a severe narrowing of any of the arteries of the heart leading to a heart attack, for example, but you may have something else related to your diabetes or hypertension, such as thick heart muscle, which often happens with diabetes and high blood pressure. When the heart muscle becomes thick, we call it what, uh, what's the Hyper medical term is hypertrophy. Uh, it leads to a dysfunction of the heart where it's unable to expand well enough. And because it can't expand well enough, blood flowing back into the heart from, your example, your legs, uh, doesn't efficiently do so. And that leads to leg swelling. And this is what you may have. So you have a form of mild heart failure or congestive cardiac failure. It may not be related to a narrowed artery or heart attack. Brother, did you, did you have an angiogram? Uh, I had an angiogram about three years ago. Gee. Okay. And was it clear? There were no narrowings there. Three years ago, it was clear now. Okay. So, so, I mean, your risk of having new disease is fairly small, but as Dr. Mamdu says, it's possible that you have something else affecting your heart rather than coronary vascular disease. You may have a vessel, a, a problem related to the muscle of the heart or relaxation of the heart okay. uh, or some other issue which is causing your shortness of breath, but it could also be something else like your lungs. Uh, obesity can cause uh, shortness of breath with exertion, especially if you're very obese, because the, the, the stomach contents sometimes restrict the movement of the diaphragm and the lungs. So I think uh, your cardiologist obviously hasn't done his job if he's told you everything's all right and you're not feeling well, because everything is not all right. Mm -hmm. If everything was all right, you would be feeling well. Mm -hmm. I suggest you go back either to your cardiologist or your general physician and look for an explanation. He needs to go through and give you a reasonable explanation and then give you a course of action, which may include just losing weight, which may include uh, treating your lungs and so forth and so on. Mm -hmm. So, uh, brother, I hope that helps you, and inshallah, we hope that your problem is resolved. We, are, we have another caller. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum wa rahmatullahi How can we help you, sister? Yes, brother, I would like to ask you, ask you a question about my cancer and my heart failure. Yes. Uh, my problem of a hand. Yes, sister, please sure. go on. Yeah, I'm having a pain from my hand almost eight years. I'm feeling pain from from the neck to one finger, just like a pain. 
So I don't know what is exactly the problem. When I go to the hospital, they only tell me there's no medicine. It's the only option that you can do is operation. And I'm worried about the operation. And when I feel that pain, I just throw it what I'm holding my hand. And what, I'm having that what operation did they suggest, sister? Here. Sister, what operation did they want to do? They, they, they told me we can only op do operation on your hand, but there is no medicine that we can give you. Else you have to try physiotherapy, but physiotherapy, it won't help you, they say okay. so. So, okay. sister, I think, I think it's important, sister, there are many operations that are performed on the heart today. And it's uh, very difficult for us to understand what, what uh, exactly say on you hand, need to on have hand. on your hand. It, it may be related to a, a condition in your heart, or it may be related to a condition in your hand, yeah. which is totally separate. I mean, pain um, going down the left arm can be a sign of heart disease, or even the right arm, mm -hmm. but it can also be a sign of disease in the shoulder, in the elbow, mm -hmm. in the wrist, in the neck. Uh, it can be a compression of a nerve in the neck. It could be carpal tunnel syndrome in the hands. It could be arthritis. So there's a variety of things which can cause pain in the hand. And there are things sometimes which won't be released by operation, uh, relieved by operation, specifically carpal tunnel syndrome. And I'm sure there are many people who have experienced that. Uh, sometimes uh, arthritis in the shoulder or uh, compression syndrome of the nerve around the elbow and so forth. So, so, sister, I would suggest that you that you discuss with them in detail what they what they mean by you need an operation and exactly what the operation is. And if they, if it makes sense to you, maybe even get a second opinion. But if 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 they're both saying the same thing, then you can go through. We have I think we we have time for one more call. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. How are you? Alhamdulillah. How are you, brother? Can we how can we help you? We have uh, time for a short short uh, call. No, no, no problem. I've got something called multi-vessel coronary disease. The doctor said it's progressive disease. Gee. I've had an angiogram done like 20 months ago and again last month. And they've told me they can't really do anything besides by exercising, eating right, and not stressing. It will just slow the disease from my arteries from closing. I didn't need to know the doctor's opinion. Are you, are you diabetic, anything. brother? Yes, I am. Gee. Okay. Unfortunately, uh, from what you describe, um, you have what we, what, when, you, when they say multi-vessel, they mean multiple vessels. As I said, there are many vessels that supply the heart muscle. And okay. perhaps the narrowings that you describe are in multiple areas affecting a very distal vessel, so the very end of the vessel. Uh, normally when we do bypasses or stents, we, we, we generally target the vessels more proximally and so that it allows blood flow from the top of the vessel down to the bottom. However, if your blockage or narrowings are very distal, so very low down, or very long, uh, or very long, for example, and affect the entire blood vessel, then bypassing that vessel, going past the narrowings, is obviously not yeah. really possible. Uh, stenting a vessel right from the top to the bottom also doesn't lead us with long-term re good results. The stents start to narrow down because they're very small near the end, and blood flow near the end of the heart vessel is a bit sluggish. Um, yeah. What they've described to you is uh, aggressive medical therapy and what they're trying to do is say to you, look, you can slow this progression of disease down, perhaps extend okay. your quality of life uh, sufficiently. Pr brother, I hope that helps you and uh, we, we make dua, inshallah, Allah at least stabilizes your condition and improves it. We, we, no. we, we, we've run out of time now, so we don't have time for any more calls. We just need to wrap up. I'd like to thank Dr. Mamdu. Alhamdulillah, has given us some wonderful insights. And obviously, I'm sure there are many of you out there who have got lots of questions. And you can f uh, forward your questions onto Facebook uh, or Twitter or via our email. And inshallah, we will try and address them in future episodes and try and plan future episodes based on what people really want to find out about. Our next week's show, inshallah, is going to be an ENT show, and we will be looking for your questions on ear, nose, and throat disease. We wish all our viewers and all the people uh, who are suffering from illness that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grants them shifa and makes things easier for them. And we, wish, we hope to see you uh, next week at the same time and same place. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alaykum as-salam.